Thank you. Ooh. Okay. Uh, many people, uh, including Lab 9 psychic Phyllis Schlemmer and Andrea, Andrea Pohoric, claim that Gene Roddenberry was very much in tune with the concept of the Nine long before his association with the group, uh, possibly as early as the, cre of, as the creation of Star Trek. And this is actually true to some degree, although I would say it's probably via his associates more than anything else. Uh, a few interesting points first of all. Star Trek was financed by Desilu Studios, and Desilu was wholly owned by Lucille Ball uh, when the time, by the time the show was pitched. Ball appeared on the Dick Cavett Show in 1974. During this interview, she famously stated that she once had some odd dental work that required fillings in 1942. This is what she said. One night I came into the valley over Coldwater Canyon and I heard music. I reached down to turn the radio off and it wasn't on. The music kept getting louder and louder and I realised it was coming from my mouth. I even recognised the tune. My mouth was humming and thumping with the drum beat and I thought I was losing my mind. I thought, what the hell is this? Then it started to subside. Five nights later, she took a different route home. All of a sudden, my mouth started jumping. It wasn't music this time, it was Morse code. As soon as it started fading, I stopped the car and started backing up until it was coming into full strength. I got the hell out of there real quick. The next day, I told the MGM security office about it and they called the FBI or something. And sure enough, they found an underground Japanese radio station. It was somebody's gardener Sure enough, they were spies. And the reason why I've recounted this story is there's some strong evidence showing that Pahorich's research involves studying methods which thoughts, ideas and messages could be implanted into another person's mind without their knowledge. It's plausible that Pahorich used this knowledge to subversively spread the message of the Nine. But Pahorich held several patents, and a number of these were devices for assisting hearing he worked with neuropsychiatrist Warren S. McCulloch when developing these devices. McCulloch was involved with cybernetic theory excuse me, and electronic brain implants. He designed and built an implantable chip that would fit into a subject's tooth. The design of this radi uh, radio tooth implant was quickly brought by the CIA and classified. In 1987, Pahorich revealed we were able to develop a hearing device that fit under the cap of a tooth and we could hear very clearly from a small relay and receiver and transmitter. Unfortunately, it was promptly classified by an agency of our government, presumably the CIA. We did solve the problems in terms of hardware. So, such a device existed. Pl plausible, maybe, that a device like that could transmit messages into somebody's head. Who knows? We should also consider Pahorich's research into wave transmissions as a possible means to convey all manner of ideas to unwitting receivers. 1969, Dr. Jose, de Jose Delgado published the book Physical Control of the Mind Towards a Psycho-Civilized Society. Delgado carried out research and experimentation with implants and wave transmissions for both the CIA and the US military. He once infamously planted chips in a bull in order to control its behavior. There's a picture of it just there at the bottom. From the mid-70s onwards, he experimented with the use of electromagnetic waves to control implants at great distance, distances. In a 1975 interview, Delgado stated that electromagnetic broadcasting for mind control had been developed to a state of effectiveness and be could utilised up to three kilometres away. That's the mid-1970s. Baharaj apparently worked with Delgado in his early career. His theory of nerve conduction inspired Jose Delgado's psychotronic implant experiments for the CIA. So there's a connection there, again, for Horridge. So moving into the Star Trek realm, a number of the original Star Trek episodes dealt with this idea of human channeling of disembodied or non-corporeal entities. Some examples return to tomorrow, the lights of Zeta. Zeta. The latter episode featured a female crew member in such a condition. The episode was written by TV legend Shari Lewis, the original puppeteer of uh, children's favourite lamb chop, that little sheep thing there, <laughs> and her husband Jeremy Tarcher. Tarcher, in collaboration with Penguin, was a literary publishing notable, responsible for many New Age themed books. He was also an Esalen board member, I shall come to Esalen in a minute. Uh, continuing his relationship with them for over 40 years, he said, uh, I first went to Esalen in 1964 with my first wife, Shari Lewis. 
The writer of the article said he was equally struck by the vitality and bonhomie of Esalen's co-founder, Michael Murphy, and the two began a friendship that continues to this day. Tarcher said, I built my company around Esalen's workshop leaders. So Jenny, Jenny O'Connor, Esalen became a surrogate home for the Naim during the late 70s and the early 80s via the seminars of British psychic Jenny O'Connor. There's a picture of her on the bottom right there. About the only picture you can find of Jenny O'Connor, actually. Uh, she gained a connection with the Nina O'Senning, the same time Esalen was becoming, a promin becoming prominent in US and Soviet political circles. A number of key figures within Gorbachev's administration were part of this exchange program at Esalen and also attended Jenny O'Connor's lectures on the Nine. The Esalen Exchange went on to run the hugely influential Gorbachev Foundation USA. Jenny O'Connor was introduced to Esalen by Sof John Whitmore, the racing driver. According to Ira, Ira Einhorn, she took over running Esalen through the Nine, and such was the influence of the Nine that they ordered the sacking of its chief financial officer and reorganised the entire management structure of Esalen. It's a powerful force in Esalen, the Nine, at that point. So just a few points here uh, that tie back to torture. Uh, John C. Lilly, who studied LSD and consciousness for the CIA, also worked at Esalen, pictured there with Dick Price. Uh, the aforementioned torture had a tenuous link to CIA's LSD Orange Sunshine. He said, the one reality, one truth perspective was totally destroyed for me by my first psychedelic trip. I had the benefit of two experienced guides and some really good LSD, Tim Scully's Orange Sunshine. I took tabs at 10 in the morning and by noon my mind had been substantially remade. Bet it had. The trip led me to a small understanding of how the mind generates its own reality and how each of these realities was a product of the mind's endless, endless cultural programming. To some extent that's actually true, but you do have to wonder, given that the, this particular type of LSD was being manufactured by the CIA, and you hear these stories at that period in time about uh, bad trips and that, so who knows. John Newland, who we saw before, uh, the host Creator, producer and director of One Step Beyond. We saw the clip with uh, Andrew Biharic in it. Um, John Newland was also the director of the Star Trek episode, Errand of Mercy. Another episode featuring extra-dimensional entities interceding in mortal affairs. One of Newland's assistant directors on One Step Beyond was Robert H. Justman. Justman was the associate producer, producer and showrunner of Star Trek during the original series. He was also the supervising producer on Star Trek The Next Generation for much of its first season. Uh, according to Memory Alpha, I think it is, the website, Justman was one of the driving forces in the formation of this series, influencing the creation of characters and the casting. It was Justman who discovered and pushed for the casting of Patrick Stewart for the role of Captain Jean-Luc Picard. Justman also brought Levar Burton onto the series. Now, uh, Levar Burton played Chief Engineer Geordie LaForge extensive history of involvement with the Institute of Noetic Sciences. His activist work has placed him in several high-profile political cir circles, most notably with the likes of Alan Tipper Gore. There's a picture of him there with Tipper Gore. He's also been associated with Bill Gates. Need say no more on that one. 2007, Burton was the host and executive producer of a documentary entitled The Science of Peace. It investigated the science and technology aimed at enabling world peace, sometimes called peace science, the film explores some of the concepts of shared noetic consciousness, having been sponsored in part by the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And there's a picture of him there on their website, Ion's website. So some of the nine symbolism in Star Trek. Perhaps the symbolism has already been there, always been there, sorry. Enterprise's registry number, NCC 1701, adds up to nine. One plus seven plus zero plus one equals one, obviously. Nine Star Trek Generation cast members. Nine Star Trek Voyager cast members, nine Deep Space Nine cast members. Uh, the latter show, of course, was called Deep Space Nine, set on a space, space station called Deep Space Nine, whilst we're on the subject of that. In September 1974, a channeling session, Roddenberry was told by the Nine, I am the beginning, I am the end, I am the emissary, I am the emissary for the Nine. The first episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine is called The Emissary. The lead character, Benjamin Sisko, embarks on a spiritual journey. He's told that he is to become the emissary. He's confronted with an orb of the prophets. He falls into a trance and experiences a vision conjured, conjured by the prophets. 
discarnate entities that exist outside of normal space and time, just like the nine, for that matter. The prophets can only communicate via visions or third-party vessels or channels, just like the nine. The prophets are worshipped by the Bajoran race as gods, just like the nine. Well, you get the idea. Cisco awakens from this state, he is told that nine orbs like this one have appeared in the skies over the last 10,000 years. And throughout the series it's established that there are nine orbs of the prophets, tears of the prophets that portray various aspects of the prophets. Coincidence or not? Uh, the influence of Lab 9 so interwoven with Star Trek, it's possible that we can gain a clearer perspective of the goals and motives of those who seeded the message of the nine throughout the franchise. Roddenberry was one of the few people involved who had anything of significance to say about the Lab 9 Star Trek connection. Nobody else ever mentioned it. This has prompted many researchers to speculate about his role. So here's a few, a few suggestions. Was he somehow subjected to a form of conditioning or implanted ideas? This idea of the Nine, was it sort of put there for him, in his head maybe? Did he do a watered down Stanley Kubrick, as I like to call it, and try to spill the beans on some part of the elite agenda? You know, particularly the more secretive aspects of Stanford Research Institute, the CIA connection maybe? Was he a manipulative, manipulative agent of agenda propaganda, a social engineer who used television, science fiction format as an elaborate cultural creation mechanism? That does tend to be the case with a lot of science fiction writers. Or was Star Trek used as an acclimatisation tool, particularly in relation to the extraterrestrial paradigm? Maybe. Maybe. It's even been suggested that Roddenberry may have been himself exposed to some sort of genuine extraterrestrial phenomenon. But that idea is riddled with contradictions. After Roddenberry's death, his son Eugene Wesley J Roddenberry Jr. created an odd comic strip called Gene's Journal. So some pictures of it there. It's described as the untold true story, true story, beyond the adolescent years of Gene Roddenberry. It was during these years that Gene was continuously abducted by aliens for the extraterrestrial purpose of studying human beings. All of his experiences recorded faithfully in his boyhood journal. These fantastic stories detailing the alien wonders he encountered would later inspire Gene to create some of his greatest science fiction television has ever seen. It's just a comic strip, but you never know. So is it possible that like Sarfati and Geller and that, Roddenberry's involvement with the Nine was preordained from a young age? Was he deemed a potential star kid, a space kid? Like Sarfati and Geller, Roddenberry had strange experiences in his youth, but tellingly none of his biographies described them as extraterrestrials or discarnate voices. They were, however, described as altered states of consciousness. Roddenberry's personal assistant, Susan Sackant, once recalled Roddenberry describing a childhood out-of-body experience. <coughs> Roddenberry's attitude towards the ET paradigm was always cautiously sceptical. He seemingly, seemingly became overtly critical of the subject later in his life. One particular area of this is the ancient alien concept, ancient alien paradigm. This is what he said about the pyramids and the idea of an ET. Concept. No, astronauts, uh, ancient astronauts did not build the pyramids. Human beings built them because they're clever and they work hard. Uh, September 19th, 2013, former Star Trek Administration scriptwriter Tracy Tormey was interviewed by George Nori on the popular radio show Coast to Coast. Tormey discussed, discussed his documentary feature film 701, which examined a number of Project Blue Book cases that remain unexplained. And he also discussed his association with Gene Roddenberry and his time he spent with him on Star Trek Administration. I'm going back, sorry. Welcome back. George Nori with you. James Fox, Tracy Torme. Tracy, let's get into some experiences you did have with Roddenberry, Carl Sagan, our dear friend, the late Ray Bradbury, about UFOs. What did they say to you? Well, they all said basically the same thing to me, um, George. Um, they were extremely anti-UFO. and that's, That surprises a lot of people. Uh, Gene Roddenberry called me into his office one day and was very, very upset that he'd heard that I was working on uh, what became Fire in the Sky, the Travis Walton story, right. and you know went into a profanity-laced <laughs> tirade about how it was all such nonsense and that these things are never seen by more than one person at a time. It's always some drunken farmer in Nebraska at 3 in the morning. There's no physical evidence. They're never seen by pilots. They're never seen by astronomers. 
And amazingly enough, I went through the same experience with Carl Sagan and with Ray Bradbury. They basically all mirrored each other, and a lot of people are very surprised to hear that, especially that someone like Gene Roddenberry was so anti-UFO, but he really was. It is strange, given how much Star Trek actually has influenced that subject. Uh, finally, it's worth mentioning the book Alien Interview by Lawrence R. Spencer, built around the accounts of Matilda O'Donnell McElroy. McElroy claimed to have uh, communicated with an extraterrestrial during the Roswell incident in 1947. The book makes several references to the concept of a council of nine. It mentions a symbol that was shown to McElroy by the creature. The symbol is allegedly indicative of something called the Domain. It's remarkably similar to the Starfle Starfleet insignia. You can see the two there. So was the fictional insignia inspired by the nine? Was the Starfleet logo simply used to embellish McElroy's account? Or did Lawrence Spencer actually just put it into the book just to, who knows? I just want to mention the Stargate Conspiracy book by uh, Lynn Picknick and Clive Prince. And um, their main contention is that there appears to be an agenda involving the likes of the US military industrial complex, scientific establishment, and the intelligence community to promote, usurp, distort certain belief systems. For example, with regard to the CIA, they note that one of the main purposes of the intelligence community is specifically to investigate the origins and structure and spread of belief systems. Picnic and Prince largely maintain that promotion of the extraterrestrial phenomenon is designed as a disinformation front to propagate certain secret society beliefs such as Freemasonry and doctrines. I don't actually go along with that belief to the degree that they do. Um, I do believe there is a level of legitimacy to quite a few uh, encounters, uh, UFO phenomena, extraterrestrial, that sort of thing. But some of their evidence is noteworthy, particularly the information they've gathered on Lab 9, Paharich and Stanford Research Institute. Just point out a few things regarding Freemasonry and some uh, interesting stuff to do with the Nine, and this also connects back to Piharich as well. Egyptian symbolism, readily associated with Masonic belief systems, uh, and it also has, uh, appears to have a connection to the principles of the Nine. Dr. Vinod uh, conveyed messages from the Nine and the Nine Principles of Forces, proclaimed themselves to be God, stating, God is nothing else than we together, the Nine Principles of God. Um, there were nine major gods of the of ancient Egypt, known as the Enad. 1954, Puharich tested the psychic abilities of Dutch sculptor Harry Stone for the Round Table Group. He fall, fell into a trance, and Stone communicated with an entity who identified himself as Rahotep, named his wife as Nefert, and mentioned the pharaoh Khufu. There were no extraterrestrial connotations to these early messages from the nine at all, whatsoever. That changed in 1955, when Paharich met Charles and Lillian Lawhead, I pronounced it right for a change, a couple who were prominent in the George Adamski UFO contactee scene. The Lawheads convinced Paharich that the nine principles were extraterrestrial, extra-dimensional in origin. And from that point on, the nine adopted characteristics that were indicative of both ETs and belief-based archetypes. September 1974, Gene Roddenberry asked a representative of the nine via the channeler, Phyllis Schlemmer. If it had a name, it replied, I am Tom, but I am also Harmachis, I am also Herenkur, I'm also known as Tum, and I am known as Atom. And they're all um, Egyptian non culture sort of labelings, names. This is a key aspect of Sinaki is the belief in nine powerful leaders derived from certain Buddhist beliefs and accounts of the Knights Templars who founded a secret order. The Templars were allegedly formed after the First Crusade by nine French knights. Fraternus Rosicrucius was allegedly steered by, the French, by a French secret order, amazingly, called the Council of Nine. Noted 32nd degree Freemason Reuben Swinburne Clymer, and a, a figure associated with the Fraternus Rosicrucius, claimed that the Council of Nine were also known as the Secret School, and that these teachings had been handed down to them from the Knights Templar. The Nine Associations also apply to the United Grand Lodge of England, pitched on the right. The lodge was founded in 1884, consecrated 1886 by nine brethren. It's that theme of nine running through Freemasonry. And talk about Freemasonry, you can't help but mention Stanford Research Institute again. Uh, the 1973 document, Changing Images of Man, based on a study by SRI. Remember that this was a period when SRI was heavily involved with CIA and the US Department of Defense just prior to RV experiments and the Lab 9 era. A notable signature on the document was SRI's Willis W. Harmon. 
Harman co-edited the report, and he was also the president of the Institute of Noetic Sciences. The report is considered one of the key blueprint documents to espouse principles of the hidden global agenda, promoting spiritual and ecological awareness and self-realisation movements, in other words, New Age movements. The report is for all intents and purposes a social engineering mandate. Notably, the report recommended the tradition of Freemasonry as one of the best options available to create social change that would benefit, benefit the agenda players. And the document itself says, restorative strategies can play an important role in the present transformation because of the fact that the new emerging image is essentially that of the Freemasonry influence, which was of such importance in the shaping of the nation's foundations. So they were pushing, SRI document, pushing for the use of Freemasonry. This idea of Freemasonry in Trek, maybe. Before becoming a writer, Roddenberry was an officer in the Los Angeles Police Department. His father was also had a career in law enforcement. It's well known that Western law enforcement agencies are a hotbed of Freemasonry. Um, Roddenberry claimed that he was uh, that he was the president of the Los Angeles City Police uh, City College Police Club. Sorry, nicknamed the Archons. He was also presented with a school service award by the Archons Men's Honorary Service Society on April 1940. The Archons idea is interesting because it ties into uh, the ET paradigm also dies in Gnosticism, this idea of uh, false. So Roddenberry claimed that the inspiration for the Star Trek episode, The Return of the Archons, came from his involvement with the Los Angeles City Police College Club. The episode was a reworking of a, of a story called Landrew's Paradise, and that was one of three proposed scripts for the pilot episode of Star Trek. The Cage was one of them, the one that was proposed first of all. So it was there right from the beginning, this idea of the Archons. Roddenberry's biographer Joel Engel put it, this was the first of what would be several Star Trek episodes in which man searches for God, finds him, debunks him and lives more happily ever afterwards or kills him off metaphorically, thus improving mankind's well-being. Roddenberry did have a, a fascination with those stories. So, what's in a name? Coincidental naming, maybe. Naming of the first captain, Christopher Pike, similar to the infamous Freemason Albert Pike. Character of Red Jack, also known as Jack the Ripper. There's Masonic undercurrents to that as well. Integral to the plot of the episode Wolf in the Fold. The name Scotty, as in the Scottish Rite Freemasonry perhaps. The name Kirk, which translates as church in several languages, Scottish and Scandinavian for example. David Alexander quotes Roddenberry as stating that Scotty was inspired by his B-17 crewmate Harry Scottidas and the seafaring tradition of Scots as engineers. With this in mind, there's the tradition of Freemasonry in seafaring history to consider as well. Um, Star Trek's Starfleet model was based on the naval ranking system. Roddenberry was determined for a considerable amount of time to name the vessel the Constitution. He also wanted to call it the Yorktown. There is a Yorktown Masonic Lodge. For those of uh, people who've looked into Masonic history, they'll know that on March the 17th, 1926, Major Genry, General Henry Knox Lodge was constituted on the gun deck of the US Navy ship, the USS Constitution. More importantly, it's the only Masonic Lodge in the world to have ever been instituted on an active ship of war. The name eventually became Enterprise, but again, that has Masonic connotations to it. Um, but it remained a Constitution-class starship. So. Some people say that Gene Roddenberry is either a 32nd or 33rd degree Freemason. I have found no evidence of that, believing. But, you know, there, there are some oddities there. There are some coincidences there. Conceived the look of the Starship Enterprise, Roddenberry scrutinised some people's massive collection of science fiction magazines and were won over by the artwork of sci-fi illustrator Frank R. Paul. It's one of his paintings from 1953. There is a similarity there, definitely a similarity. What's interesting about Frank Paul's work, though, is it's full of occult, masonic and esoteric imagery. That's a bit of a picture there on the right there. Destroying the masses. <laughs> oh. One. Similarity of the Starfleet insignia and the Vulcan edict, infinite diversity and infinite combination symbol to the pyramid and the all and I maybe. You can see there are some, there are some similarities there. Uh, the square and compass of Freemasonry and so on. Uh, interestingly as well, a friend of mine actually pointed this out to me the other day, the original different divisions, I think science, command and engineering um, on the three different logos. The pointer isn't working. He said... All C and I, star, does that look like the G from Freemasonry? Who knows? Who knows? It's interesting though. 
pyramid triangle hand gesture appears in the episode The Way, of, Way to Eden. The gesture is described as an oval. Many celebrities are seen making this gesture in videos, on stage and photographs. Overall, this seems to be indicative of occultism, ritualisms, secret societies, and more generic aspects of the global agenda. People say the Illuminati, that sort of thing. But it's there, we see it all the time. It's interesting that it was in that episode of Star Trek. Disturbing similarity between the movie era, rank insignia pins, and some Masonic regalia. Check out the shape and design of the various Admiral pins pictured along the bottom there from Star Trek. And comparisons with the Knights of Malta, Knights Templar pins. I would say there's definitely a similarity there. Strange New World Order. According to Kevin Carr in the movie Watcher's Guide to Star Trek, Gene Roddenberry also chose to make the symbol for the United Federation planets to emulate that of the United Nations in order to further show his progressive thinking. The Federation's charter also mirrors that of the United Nations charter. There is a definite similarity between the Starfleet logo and the United Nations. So. Researcher Alan Watt has discussed the role of Star Trek in a United Nations New World Order agenda. I remain very cautious of some of Watt's views and associations, particularly his affiliation with the highly dubious Alex Jones. Um, but his point that he makes about this idea of science fiction writers, luminaries, and that being futurists and their connections to predictive programming, it's, a, it's an important point, it's a salient point. February 2009 edition of his radio show, Cutting Through the Matrix, he discussed Star Trek with one of his callers. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's interesting, that whole series was predictive programming, though, because, as I say, they gave you a setting to do with the world, but they put the setting in space, because it was about multiculturalism, all the different aliens they'd meet, and all, all the, the, the worlds, which are just countries, would come in under this big UN agenda. Uh, that's really what it was showing you, is that it was the future, and the, the types that all joined uh, for, for international or interstellar space trade, free trade, that were the good guys. But anyone who said, no, we don't want to join you, were always portrayed as bad and evil and primitive. Right, the United Federation of Planets. That's right. That's what that is, right? Yeah, and in yeah, one of the shows, too, they also showed you uh, a planet where, where no one died. It, it conquered the death. And so the whole idea was to get Kirk in there so that you could infect one of them who were so bored of living forever uh, with a disease. Uh, and, so, and they showed you all these people crowding outside the Star Trek, just millions of faces uh, pressing in with overpopulation. So you, you were getting all these messages from fiction that yeah. now affect us today because that's what the programming was for, our, our own age group growing up to where we are today. Yeah. yeah, pretty much every episode I watch, I'm like, I totally know what you're talking about with the producer yes. programming because I can relate it to what's really happening. <laughs> it is, and, and the Red mm -hmm. Berry, uh, you know, Gene Rodenberry, um, he was a member of NASA. He was. Yes, mm -hmm. and, uh, and of course he was getting the stuff from NASA who helped plan the scientific future they're going to bring in, and he was told to go home and write stories around them, and that's how he could put that into his episodes. Really? So it wasn't just his, completely his imagination? No, not never. These guys no. have no better imaginations than anyone else. They're always given... Uh, same with the sci-fi writers. They all uh, belong to the Futurist uh, Association. And the big foundations, they will fund you to write stories around particular topics and make them sound interesting. But they'll tell you the main details to write around. So they'll, they'll have meetings and, and stuff, and then they'll just draw their material from that? Yes. Wow, unbelievable. Anyway, I will come to the NASA connection in a moment, but first of all, I just want to talk about the, uh, the idea of Star Trek as a, a propaganda recruitment tool for the military-industrial complex. During Trek's run, Gene Roddenberry and his production team extensively collaborated with all branches of the military and scientific establishment. One of Roddenberry's early advisors was an Air Force colonel named Donald Prickett, and he consulted him in 1964. The original 60s Enterprise design, bridge design attracted the attention of the US Navy, who dispatched three officers to the Trek sound stages. Matt Jeffries, Trek's legendary uh, designer and art director, uh, he had extensive documents and design blueprints procured from NASA, JPL, Douglas and Boeing. These documents, along with his own design notes, were shared with the visitors from the Navy. A year later, Jeffries was contacted by the Navy to thank him for his help. 
It appears that those original design notes became the touchstone for the creation of the then classified Naval Communication Centre in San Diego. Unfortunately, Jeff Jeffries was not able to see it at the time as it was a classified installation. But you wouldn't know what it looked like because it was based on the bridge. So. <laughs> uh, David L. Robb, in his book Operation Hollywood, excellent book, described how the producers of the fourth Star Trek movie, The Voyage Home, were allowed to film a portion of the feature on the aircraft carrier, the USS Ranger, which doubled for the carrier USS Enterprise, in exchange for extensive Pentagon rewrites to the script. And that has been documented. Three naval officers from the USS Enterprise, Robert S. Pickering, Sarah Elizabeth Pizzo and Timothy J. Whittington, visited the Star Trek Enterprise sound stages, presented with a plaque by the producers, and they were also given cameo roles in the episode Desert Co Crossing as engineering officers. In 1990, Star Trek Next Generation's character Wesley Crusher, played by Will Wheaton, was promoted to a full ensign. Roddenberry was joined on the set by General Colin Powell, then chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, to present Will Wheaton with Roddenberry's own military ensign bars. Powell is now infamous for sitting in front of the United Nations and lying to the world about Iraqi weapons of mass destruction, as we know. Powell's neocon cabal cohort, that's a mouthful, Ronald Reagan, also visited the set of Star Trek Administration in April 1991. Pictured at the bottom there. Harv Bennett, a notable figure in the history of Star Trek, he really changed the fortunes of the movie era of Star Trek from Star Trek II onwards. Um, from 1953, throughout the Korean War, he served with the US Army. You might say there's nothing surprising about that, given the time and the war. But throughout his career in television and film, Mr. Bennett maintained his ties with military roots. In 1984, due to several TV and film projects he had done with the Pentagon Corporation, the US Army named him civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army for California with a protocol rank of Lieutenant General, a three-star general working in Hollywood promoting it. He served as a liaison between the Army and the entertainment industry until 1992, travelling frequently and visiting every important Army outpost from West Point to the National Training Centre in Barstow, and establishing friendships with great soldiers of the time, including Generals Colin Powell, Norman Schwarzkopf and Wesley Clark. For his work in helping produce the worldwide celebrations of the 50th anniversary of D-Day, he received the Distinguished Civilian Service Medal from the Department of Defence, and that medal is the Department of Defense's second highest civilian award. It's quite an accolade, that. During the 1960s, while envisioning the original Star Trek fleet technology, the Star Trek production team extensively consulted JPL, scientists, Douglas, Lockheed engineers, the US Air Force, RAND experts, engineers who worked on NASA's unmanned space probe program. In a letter to his close friend Isaac Asimov, in November 1966, Roddenberry stated that a RAND Corporation physicist was hired by us to review all our stories and scripts. Kellum DeForest Research was also hired to do the same job. This is taken from Gene Roddenberry's own official website. While making Star Trek, Roddenberry's reputation as a futurist began to grow. His papers and lectures earned him high professional regard as a visionary. He spoke on the subject at NASA, uh, the Smithsonian Institute, Library of Congress gatherings and top universities. One of the first dedicated Star Trek conventions held in New York in 1972, NASA became involved with the event. They provided a one-third size mock-up of the alleged Apollo lunar excursion model, mo module and a full-size spacesuit. Over the course of three days, several thousand fans attended. It was unofficial involvement, allegedly, at that point. William Shatner described that during the early production of the aborted Star Trek Phase II series, Genuine NASA surplus was integrated into our ship's controls, replacing the hastily glued, cheap plastic doodads of the past. Jesko von Putkarma, key technical advisor on Star Trek The Motion Picture. Putkarma was part of Werner von Braun's rocket team at NASA Marshall Space Flight, Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, during the Apollo program. From 1974, he was NASA's program manager in charge of long-range planning of deep space manned activities. Following the completion of the first Star Trek film, Roddenberry was honoured by NASA at the National Space Club in Washington, D.C. on March the 30th, 1979. This connection was growing. Star Trek The Next Generation played to the hosts to the likes of Dr. Stephen Hawking and Dr. Mae Jemison, a former NASA astronaut. Hawking played himself in the episode Descent. Jemison played a transporter operation in an episode called Second Chances. Jemison was invited onto the show by Lee Barburton, incidentally. 
Two NASA astronauts also appeared in the final episode of Star Trek Enterprise. September 24th, 1992, 11 months after his death, Roddenberry was recommended for a posthumous NASA medal for distinguished public service. His widow, Major Barrett Roddenberry, accepted the award on January the 30th, 1993, at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. William Shatner has also been presented with the same award in 2014, April. So this idea of the stars joining in, several cast members have extensive history with NASA. Nichelle Nichols, who played Lieutenant Uhura, uh, became an advocate of women and ethnic minorities in NASA. Nichols met Jessica von Puttkamer, who was featured speaker at a convention in Chicago during 1975. His presentation about the space program represented the first time that NASA had an official presence at a Star Trek convention. In her 1994 autobiography, Nichols described how she was inspired by his presentation and decided to address the space agency's poor record of inclusion. Eventually, Nichols was appointed to the board of directors of the National Space Institute and was hired to head up the outreach program, recruitment into NASA. In more recent years, she's been moving in uh, higher political circles, most notably smoozing with uh, Barack Obama there in 2012. Oops. 1986, DeForest Kelly played Dr. Bones McCoy as a guest on Bill Jenkins' Open Minds radio show. He was discussing a UFO encounter he once had, as well as being witness to the 1942 Battle of Los Angeles event. And he talked about the intimate relationship between NASA and Trek. This is a little clip from the uh, interview. And NASA works with us on our personal appearances. There is always somebody there from NASA with us because they feel that we have lots of the youth, so to speak, and they're there to sell them on uh, their program. NASA is there to sell them on their program. James Doohan, also had an association with NASA, documented having visited the Dryden Flight Research Centre in 1967, once praised by Neil Armstrong, an engineer before participating in uh, the Apollo program. Told him on stage at Dewan's last public appearance from one old engineer to another. Thanks, mate. I should note, though, but in Dewan's defence, he uh, narrated an eye opening documentary that addressed in depth the subject of cold fusion, entitled Cold Fusion Fire from Water. So maybe not all of them are on you know, the same song sheet when it comes to agendas. On the other hand, some actors involved in Star Trek. This is February 19th, 2004, a special event held in Los Angeles to launch the DVD release of Star Trek Voyager to honour the efforts of NASA, JPL and those involved with furthering the exploration of space. The event at California's Science Centre Explorer Store Satellite featured several Voyager cast members, Tim Russ, Garrett Wong, Ethan Phillips and Robert Picardo. They presented a plaque to NASA's Dr Janice Voss and JPL research scientist Dr Michael Kobrick, who was also in attendance. In publicity interviews filmed after the ceremony, Robert Picardo made some interesting remarks. He was keen to talk about NASA inspiring careers and the influence of Star Trek, but there was something he wasn't saying. I'm going to show you a clip of it in a minute. It's not very good picture quality, but the sound's there. I want you to watch his eyes, watch his body language. Stilted comments. It's like he was trying to suggest that he was, that he was trying to avoid saying something, basically. That, basically what it was that he had a substantial connection to NASA and JPL. You watch his eyes when he starts talking about it. It's a pleasure for me to meet uh, people who work at, uh, in NASA, particularly in Jet Propulsion Laboratory, because that's where I, that's where I'm closest to, and I've visited there many times. Who grew up watching Star Trek? That's where I'm. That's where I'm. It's like he was going to say something. This is probably what he was going to say, actually. Uh, he played the emergency medical hologram in Star Trek Voyager, served on the advisory board of the Planetary Society for, my, to my knowledge, at least 15 years. The Planetary Society collaborates very closely with NASA and JPL. Picardo is good friends with Bill Nye, also known as the mainstream media scientific shill, the science guy. Nye is the current CEO of the Planetary Society. There's a little clip to give you an idea of their many collaborations. Hey, Bill. Bob, what are you doing? I'm dusting off the rover. Is the rover dusty? Yes, it's been on Mars for 10 years. 10 years, let's have a party. Yes! <laughs> We're having a rover party virtually around the world. That's right, Spirit and Opportunity have been on Mars for 10 years and we're throwing a birthday party for them. It's your place, your house, your food, your friends, 
our website. Go to planetary.org slash rover parties. We're going to have radio broadcasts. We're going to have games. We're going to have... Uh, we're going to have special guests that are reminiscing guests. about spirit and opportunity. We're going to have a description of fictional Martians. It says so right here. Of course. Cool. Trivia games, radio program, puzzles, mazes, and pictures you can't afford to miss this. You can send a message of congratulations to everyone who worked on these two rovers. It's extraordinary. And that's right. Don't miss it. From the 3rd to the 26th, 26th of, of January, January, your virtual party on Mars. Planetary.org slash rover party. It's a real, real honor to the Planetary Society. Dedicated to promoting mainstream scientific notions of space exploration, particularly the idea that Mars is red, although clearly it isn't just red, or red for that matter, <laughs> I think. It's interesting to note that the group's by its own admission, sponsored by the likes of Underwriters Laboratories. Now this is important. The mouth of Bill Nye. I'd like to again thank our sponsors, Joseph and Kathy Ryan, Toshiba America, Bamag Industries, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratories, Stellar Exploration and Underwriters Laboratories Inc. and the many members and friends who represent 30 years of the Planetary Society sorry, and our myriad projects. This raises a number of questions about the connection between Underwriters Laboratories, NIST and the 9-11 cover story. For more on this subject, I suggest Checking out the detailed ga evidence gathered by Dr. Judy Wood in her excellent book, Where Did the Towers Go? Evidence of directed free energy technology on 9-11. Particularly her request for correction, the RFC, to the NIST WTC reports and her KETAM case versus a number of defendants, including underwriters' laboratories. Robert Picardo was involved with the Planetary Society's Red Rover Goes to Mars project. He's pictured there with some of the Red Rover kids. Shortly after 9-11, the Red Rover Goes to Mars project petitioned JPL and Honeybee Robotics to pay tribute to the lives lost on 9-11. Honeybee Robotics allegedly incorporated aluminium recovered from the site of the WTC towers in the weeks after their destruction. It was seemingly used to serve as a cable guard for the rock abrasion tool on NASA's Mars Spirit and Opportunity rovers. So just plug in that. A memorial plaque was also fashioned on each vehicle. So... Not only does the 9-11 PSYOP exist on the Earth, it also exists on Mars. Um, when Star Trek finally returned to the cultural zeitgeist in 2009, it was spearheaded by J.J. Abrams and his renowned band of fellow writers and producers and directors who I called the J.J. Brigade, a group that cut their teeth primarily working on multiple television projects for ABC and Disney. The rebooted... Star Trek movie was scattered with occult and esoteric symbolism. You can see some examples there, the pyramid and the, there's a triangle around Scotty's eye there, the Masonic floor, etc, etc. Uh, it should come as no surprise, given that the JJ Brigade frequently indulge in such symbolism. I would suggest checking out the likes of TV series like Lost, Fringe, Once Upon a Time. I've written extensively about these programs on my blog. Uh, it just boggles the mind it does when you really look into the depth of the stuff that's in it. So there's a deep connection there between uh, this group and Disney. And also we should bear in mind that Disney indulges in that sort of symbolism all the time. There's also alleged connections to celebrity mind control phenomenon with Disney, so, which I've also written about. The JJ Brigade have recently taken the helm of the new Star Wars franchise, which George Lucas sold to Disney. Interesting, it ties back to George Lucas having once wanted to buy Star Trek before he created Star Wars. So. 2013 reboot sequel, Star Trek Into Darkness, and it was an affront to anybody who was even the most basic understanding of global agendas. The film's first teaser trailer was released. It certainly raised a few eyebrows, depicting a blatant metaphor to the destruction unleashed on New York on September 11, 2001. I actually posted the, put the poster on my blog straight away as soon as it was out there, as did I with the first trailer. And Nothing was really known about the plot of the film at that point, but I think it seemed pretty obvious what was going on. Uh, the trailer was a blitz of dark symbolism, carnage, a dialogue about fear and revenge. Just give you an idea. You think your world is safe? It is an illusion. This that we're sold in the mainstream news, and you recognise any of this stuff? 
we get pummeled with it in the news all the time. The film was released and it came as no surprise that the plot involved genetically engineered super soldier Khan, labelled in the film as the ultimate weapon of mass destruction, recruited by the powers that be to develop more effective ways to wage war. Various internet articles discussed the war and terror analogy, including one by Darren Franich, described the character as a Bin Laden Hussein figure, a man who was armed by one government to fight another government, wound up turning on his former allies. The film was a, re a weak rehash of the original Star uh, series episode Space Seed and the movie Star Trek II. I actually think it's a crap film, but that's my own personal opinion. Uh, Khan was also portrayed as a genetically engineered super soldier in these stories, in the original stories. And in that episode, The Space Seed, he's heard to utter the words, we offered the world order. Uh, Harv Bennett once described the original Khan as like Osama bin Laden. Where is he? What do you do with him? So they decide to exile him to some place, far place. Plot of Star Trek Into Darkness, an analogous reinforcement of the official version of the 9-11 narrative that we get pummeled with all the time. The ultimate insult came in the climax of the film and carnage struck San Francisco. The manufactured aspects of the war on terror paradigm were justified and a dedication to the post-9-11 veterans were included in the closing credits of the film. So Star Trek, overall, serving an agenda, any number of agendas maybe. The road subsequently taken by the Star Trek franchise has deviated far from Roddenberry's original vision. Roddenberry was aware of this shift towards the end of his life. And for whatever reasons, he wasn't happy about it. He talked about the over-militarisation of the Star Trek television series and things like that. Which is odd, given the connections he did have with the military, but there you go. <laughs> um, for whatever reason, he wasn't happy about it. Some of Roddenberry's ashes were launched into space after his death. And in the years following, his widow, Major Barrett Roddenberry, often spoke of his final resting place and his feelings about the legacy of Star Trek. This is what she had to say. When Gene died, I, you know, I said, wouldn't it be great if we could bury him in, in uh, space? And that word just got around and people started to talk about it. And one day they came and said, would you like to send Gene's ashes up? And I said, wow, <laughs> yeah, of course I would. I got to send a little vial of Gene's ashes up. We watched it on TV, the launch. He's up there now going around every 90 minutes looking down saying, what have you done to my show? <laughs> what have you done to my show? She made this comment many, many times following Gene Roddenberry's death. And I've often wondered what she really meant by it. Did she know something? Am I just reading something too much into that maybe? Star Trek, like many other examples from the science fiction genre, is more than just mere entertainment. It's more than a cultural phenomenon. It's more than part of the cultural zeitgeist. By the aspects I've highlighted this evening, it's clear that the show is deeply connected to the machinations of the global power elite. If it has served an agenda, has it always been that way? Have there been a variety of agendas over the years? It's difficult to know with exact certainty what Gene Roddenberry's motives were with the show. Was he trying to reveal something profound or was he simply a pawn in a much larger plan? I'll leave you to the, consider that and I'll also leave you with a quote from the man himself made in September 1985 at the Hollywood Boulevard Star Party. He said, when they say on a show created by anyone, like created by Gene Roddenberry, that is not true. I laid out a pathway. And then the only thing I will take credit for is surrounding myself by very bright people who came up with all those wonderful things and then you can appear very smart. So were there other people pulling the strings? With that, I just want to say thank you very much for listening tonight. I hope you've enjoyed the talk. Uh, if you want to check out any of my articles, my website is thetruthseekersguide.blogspot.co.uk. Uh, if you put .com, it will also come up, but it leaves off the, li the links and various other stuff along the side of it. Uh, there's my book, Science Fiction and the Hidden Global Agenda. Uh, Andrew Johnson has also put um, a PDF version of it on his website, checktheevidence.com. Excellent website, excellent researcher. I'm not just saying that because he's here tonight, it's the truth. He did pay me many money, but you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed the time. Thank you. Thank you.